All right, welcome to another episode of the Momentum Interview Series. Today, I'm speaking to Megan Smith, the Senior Manager of Deal Desk at HubSpot. Megan, thank you so much for making the time to talk today. And then what's something unexpected about you that most people don't know? I, I'm, I'm pretty pretty much an open book, so there's not a huge amount of people don't know about me. But mm. I think one thing that people are very surprised to learn about me is that I'm really bad at math. And I okay. don't like math. So that's kind of, I think some people have a perception that deal desk people are very, very good at math. That's just not me. I was literally thinking about that just now. I was like, you you probably deal with huge numbers on a daily basis. So you have to like math yeah. a little bit. I know. A little, it just stresses me out. It's like a puzzle. Mm. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. And so, you know, speaking of HubSpot, you started your career in the year 2004. Why don't you give us a brief yeah. walkthrough of your journey in the game so far? Sure. So I was really lucky that my mom uh, was a senior person in operation. So I started working at 16 at like summer jobs. Um, mm. And so I had a great like professional experience in finance companies and kind of semi-state and government bodies. Um, and then I started on a long term contract at Google. Um, which was during a time where I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my career. I had studied my master's in military history. And I, at that point, thought I would become a lecturer. Um, oh. And then I realized research was just not, <laughs> not my forte. So I went out into the business world. Um, and then I really enjoyed my time in Google and was really passionate about what they were doing there. And I got the opportunity to interview at LinkedIn um, in Dublin for an order management role, um, which I subsequently got. Um, and that really changed my career path. I became really passionate about helping salespeople succeed um, and solving problems for them. So I spent four years at, four years at uh, LinkedIn where the role transformed from order management into kind of sales process into deal desk. Um, and I led the EMEA team there for a period of time. Um, I then moved to Dropbox um, as the first EMEA hire uh, to deal desk there. And that was great. It was a huge opportunity for me. It was a momentous time for me personally. I got engaged, married, had my first kid there. Um, so it has a really big uh, role in my life. Um, and then I got the opportunity to come to HubSpot and be the first global deal desk hire and set up the team here. So I'm really excited, really excited. Would you say you enjoy breaking these records, being the first of <laughs> something or someone? I don't think I've ever thought about it as like breaking records, but mm. yeah, I mean, being the first comes with its own unique challenges. You know, mm. there's there's not a huge amount of support necessarily. You're doing things for the first time. I mean, the good news is you're not following in anyone's footsteps, so no one's comparing yeah. you. Um, but it is it's 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 tough as much good as there is and as much innovation that you get to there's also that kind of constant is this the right thing are we doing this the best way possible um and i think it's it's a challenge and it's a challenge i really enjoy a bit of a curveball for you so a lot of people end up in professions that weren't really their first choice growing up what was your first love because i mean you said you studied military history and now you're working in tech but what did you want to do when you were growing up I wanted to be a journalist for a long, okay. long time. Um, I loved writing. I loved English. Um, I used to write little stories when I was a kid and then make my mother read them. Um, so I'm sure not the best. But um, and so I, I really wanted to go into that. And then uh, I did history in college and I loved history and I love learning and again, writing. And then it just what happened to me was I realized that I love reading and research and history so much that having to do it academically at that level was sucking the joy out of it for me. Um, and so I didn't pick up a nonfiction book for years after I graduated. Um, so I'm only kind of now getting back into history and nonfiction as a, as a nice thing. So before you came to HubSpot, you were at Dropbox. What was the biggest change you had to adjust to uh, when you were making the move? I think um, there's two. I think one is the sheer size of HubSpot when stacked against Dropbox, like just an employee size, 5,000 employees um, approximately um, at HubSpot versus the, you know, 1,000, 2,000 max at Dropbox. Um, so that was one thing. The other thing is, um, is kind of an ego-based one. You know, I went from being subject matter expert, knowing everyone. I'd been there for so long that, you know, there wasn't a problem I didn't know how to solve or didn't know who could solve it for me. And so that shift is always really difficult um, to kind of go back to kind of 
not knowing uh, on a daily basis kind of what you're doing or where to go. So mm. uh, that's that's been a big shift. And hopefully, because you've acclimatized by now, when you think about your current role, what do you spend most of your time doing? So at the minute, because we're scaling the team, I kind of spend half of my time doing um, very tactical work, like helping salespeople um, unclog deals. And then also we spend a lot of time on the strategy. So scaling up the function at HubSpot has been defining what that function is, defining what good looks like, figuring out engagement models and looking across the industry. And I'm grateful that I have a lot of um, mentors and colleagues and friends who work in the industry. And so um, figuring out how we can build the best possible deal desk team and function at HubSpot. So that's kind of constantly uh, top of mind for me every day. And then speaking of deal desks, you've worked in deal desks for quite a while now. What are some of the friction points affecting most deal desks today, especially like with HubSpot dealing with international clients? From an international perspective, I think one of the major challenges that every deal desk team comes up against is standardization. So I think as deal desk people, we always want to make sure that we're not, that everything we're doing is not custom. It's not a one-off. And I think we always look to kind of what I call do standardly non-standard things. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's great and it's, you know, hugely important. But when you're doing it internationally, it poses a bit of a challenge because what works for North America, what works mm. in LATAM is not going to work in EMEA or it's not going to work in Japan. And there's that kind of balance between standardization to move mm. forward and move forward efficiently versus having to adapt to the cultural way of doing business or different expectations in different markets. So I think that's uh, internationally, that's a major kind of friction point. And with that standardization philosophy, that means you probably have a good idea of the kind of metrics you use to judge a deal desk. What are your top three? Right. Um, so my top three are um, reduction in time to close. So how quickly we can help a salesperson move their deal through the cycle. Um, overall um, selling price increase. So I like to make sure that deal desk is increasing the overall ASP where possible, that we're not driving down the price to the lowest denominator. And then also feedback. It's not necessarily as measurable as, as some of those other ones, but feedback is hugely important to me. And I think going out to the field and to cross-functional partners and making sure that they're happy with the work that we're doing um, is, is really key to building those partnerships and getting better as a team. And I mean, at LinkedIn, you said that you were the subject matter expert and mm. you did a lot of coaching as part of your job, uh, mm. one-on-ones with your direct reports. What's one core lesson or takeaway that you ultimately sought to leave them with? I consider myself very lucky that I began my management career at LinkedIn because there was so much investment. You know, the culture at LinkedIn was to get better and to leave as a better professional than when you started. And I count myself really, really lucky that I began that part of my career there. Mm. And I think that's it. It's the, I feel that I will have been successful as a lead and a manager and a coach if my team leaves me as better professionals and that they go to bigger jobs or they double down on the jobs that they're doing um, and that they're passionate and motivated by what they're doing. Um, and I think that is, for me, is the measure of success is how happy in their careers my team is. What's the best professional compliment you've ever received? Oh, God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the best professional compliment. Um, I think I've been told a lot, and it sounds braggy, but I've been told a lot about the impact that I've had on people's careers, people who report to me, and that's great because it's part of the job. But I think mm -hmm. one of the things that really happened to me recently was someone I worked with, not directly, but kind of on a cross-functional team, reached out to me to say that they had recently undergone a career pivot and that they were so grateful and supportive, or sorry, so grateful and appreciative of the support I had given them and I had made an off-the-cuff off comment to them that you have to just find your joy and chase it until you get there. And it was something I don't even remember saying it to that person. It is something I do say to people. But to have that impact, I think, is probably the biggest compliment I've had um, professionally in my career. 
I love that. I think we're just going to move that directly to the beginning of this interview. <laughs> um, so what are some of the trends in deal desk management that companies should be aware of, in your opinion? With remote and with COVID and, you know, the changing workforce, people no longer want to sit at their desks waiting for updates. And I think there is a push um, for deal desk to kind of get better, for want of a better phrase, around doing more with less and being, you know, automating updates and workflows and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I think that's one of the big pushes in the industry. How big is your team right now at HubSpot, roughly? My team at HubSpot is two. It's two people. It's me um, and my recent new hire, uh, Arthur, nice. who's so great. Um, and we're hiring on the East Coast um, for an analyst and we're hiring an EMEA later on this year. So the team's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger right into 2022 um but right now it's the two of us we're nailing it and and with the two of you what experiments have you guys run lately that you were super proud of one of the biggest experiments that we're running have run and are running is we're mm. experimenting with our engagement model um mm. so there's effectively there's two types of engagement model there's proactive and there's reactive and it's always been my dream, which sounds really lame, but it's genuine. It's always been my dream to run a proactive deal desk, someone who, a team that's really, really closely partnership with sales so that, you know, they're not coming to us to put out fires, but we can help them predict where the fires are going to start and put them out before they gain any traction. Um, and that's the experiment that we've been mostly successful. There's been some hiccups, definitely. I think mm. one of the things that I hadn't, necessarily thought through was what a proactive engagement model means for tracking metrics and stuff mm. like that because you know a reactive model is tends to be very ticket based tends mm. to be very easily reportable but a mm. proactive model is very is, is a lot more casual mm. and that can be difficult to kind of figure out where do resources need to go mm. where should we be spending our time so that's we're in the process of kind of ironing out those those flaws want for a better phrase and then let's talk tools for a bit. So what's your sales stack like at HubSpot? Oh God, it was not an exhaustive list. Let me just be upfront about that. Um, but I'll talk about my favorite tools. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, from a comms perspective, we use Zoom, we use Slack. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Slack. We use Gmail. Um, mm -hmm. We use HubSpot CRM, which has been great. Um, I've been... I've been at Salesforce uh, houses for the last two roles in my career, and it's been mm. uh, a big shift for me, but the tool is amazing. Um, the level of detail and insight it gives is incredible. Um, mm. We also use things like Gong, which has been one of my favorite uh, tools. Um, I think it's just fascinating uh, to be able to listen back to calls and identify trends. We use Crayon for competitive information. Um, which again, in the deal desk role has been super helpful because you can dig out, um, you know, things like pricing or how we stack up from a process perspective or, you know, things that competitors have done in the past. And that's mm. been super helpful to the role. Slack is definitely from a deal desk working with sales, one of the best tools that we use and the tool that I use most commonly. It's on mute at the minute, but I can see the icons stacking up in the corner. Um, and it's been great. And they've done a huge amount of work so I do a huge amount of work on things like you know scheduled send reminders and so it's like it's amazing to be able to use it and pull teams into deal rooms and all that kind of mm. stuff so it's been great and then speaking of deal rooms I mean we talk a lot about processes when it comes to facilitating mm. deals but what's your rough blueprint for how deal does could function I think it's 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 an interesting question because there's no hard and fast rule. I mm. genuinely believe that. And I think, you know, throughout this interview series, like you, you will get different answers from different people. But I think mm. that for me, it means deal desk, this idea of deal desk is the funnel. Like deal desk should really be the first point of contact before mm. we move internally. And we can help the sales team figure out, you know, if a deal is worth it for want of a better mm. phrase, not just from a dollar value, but what are some of the levers that we can pull without having to reinvent the wheel? What are some of the people we need to pull in? What, you know, what will they expect to see? What will they need to see? And so that idea of like deal desk as a funnel to kind of evaluate a deal. And once we move through that funnel, get answers to all those questions. And we usually do that in Slack. Um, we then move to put like a formal proposal together internally, send that to the relevant cross-functional teams, deal with any feedback or concerns, and then move into like proposal stage and going back to the customer. 
Um, so okay. which necessary team roles would you want to add to a deal desk? I think one of the things that you need to go back to your earlier question about, you know, industry standards and, and all that kind of stuff. One of the things that I'm seeing more and more of from um, other people in the industry is this idea of um, deal desk owning RFPs and RFIs. Um, and I think that is fast becoming a necessary uh, role. Um, so that's one thing that I would seek to add to deal desk is people who are very good at you know, um, processing those forms in a kind of a very value added kind of way. Um, and I think the only other thing I would add is enablement, you know, like it, for deal desk, it's so important that we're working with sales and we're helping them upskill and getting them used to, you know, deal trends and things that we see in the market. And I think having a core enablement resource in a deal desk team that's primarily focused on training sales teams um, and cross-functional partners is key. What kind of culture sure. has the leadership team mm. built at HubSpot and how's that working out for you? Well, I mean, the, the pithy answer is a great one. Um, but in all, in all honesty, HubSpot's culture is a large part of the reason that I came here. Um, mm. So at a high level, we operate under this idea of heart, so people acting with empathy. One of the things that really resonates with me as a deal desk person is this idea of solving for the customer. Um, and that's one of HubSpot's core tenants. And it's what deal desk does on a daily basis. So it's great to see, you know, your role mirrored in a company value. Um, I think as well with, you know, COVID and the changing world and all of that kind of stuff, um, HubSpot's leadership team have been very good at, trying to prevent employee burnout. We just got back uh, this week from a global week of rest where everyone took the week off with the exception of a couple mm. of teams that were required to keep the lights on. We do no meeting Fridays, which has been great. I was a bit, you know, a bit of a naysayer on that when I first started, but it is actually so helpful and people do really respect it, which is always key. Um, and so things like that have been tremendous for me as a new starter um to kind of be a part of a company like that you're a new starter at hubspot but i mean in all your previous roles you've probably been involved in a few hiring rounds oh, yes. what's one trait or achievement in a candidate that would make you instantly swipe right empathy mm -hmm. is what i look for in in everyone i hire i think mm -hmm. i've often said to people I can teach you anything, but I can't teach you how to be empathetic. Um, I can teach you any skill, any system, any process, but empathy is one of those things that you've either got it or you don't. And when, when people demonstrate empathy to me in an interview, they move instantly to the top of my list. And then the opposite of that. So if empathy is what would make you move them forward in the list, what's right. one instant red flag for you? I think anyone who talks about salespeople like they're an inconvenience is, is a killer for me in an interview. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I've sat in rooms with people and I've talked smack about salespeople and I've complained and all that kind of stuff. But coming into an interview or meeting with me and kind of saying, oh, you know, salespeople are being dismissive just really really kills me and it kills the interview for me because one you're not demonstrating empathy and two these people are our key stakeholders you know you don't have to like everyone you work with but coming mm. in with the attitude of salespeople are somehow lesser is just mm. not not good enough and it doesn't fly with me noted <laughs> let's get a little <laughs> <laughs> very punchy there <laughs> let's, let's let's get a little personal now what's your best productivity tip Oh, I mean, I, so I started using um, the Pomelo method, which is where you work for 20 minutes and you take a five minute break and you do that a couple of times and then you take a 15 minute break. So I started using that, especially for strategy um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that um, to kind of really focus and make sure I wasn't, you know, drifting off onto Instagram. Um, but I also find a to-do list at the start of the day is great. I get huge satisfaction scratching things off my to-do list. Mm. Um, and it's nice to see kind of at the end of the day, because, you know, when you're in meetings and you're emailing, you don't necessarily have any idea where the day went. So it's great mm. to be able to look at a list and go, you know what, I should actually do something today. And it was super, mm. super helpful. So those are my top two tips.
I've always been fascinated by the distractions that people reach for. So for you, it's yeah. Instagram. For me, it's TikTok. Instagram. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, you see, TikTok is great, but it's it's a time sink. I have to like remove it from my phone. It's yeah. horrifying. I'm, I'm, I'm this close to doing the same. And then which, which recent book or podcast episode or talk oh. had an impact on you? Wow. So I actually just finished um, every new story at HubSpot gets a copy of The Culture Map. Um, by Erin Meyer um, and it's about you know working in a kind of a global world and understanding culture and part of the reason it so deeply resonated with me was because mm. there's this whole chapter about different cultures perceptions of time mm. um, and it was really really interesting to me because one I'm pathologically late to everything like I've tried so hard to stop but even working remotely I'm two to three minutes late for everything um, mm. But what was interesting to me was there's this whole chapter about people's reactions to being late. So if you work, and I think this is kind of Aaron's point. So if you work in kind of like the East Coast America and mm. you're five minutes late, chances are you're on the phone to your boss going, I'm late. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm going to be another couple of minutes. Do you want to reschedule? But mm. you look at other countries, five minutes late, and certainly that's the case in Ireland, five minutes late is on time here. Um, and so you don't get phone calls and I don't make phone calls when I'm five mm. minutes late. And so it's it's acting with empathy and recognizing that just because it's your experience or your culture doesn't mean that it's everyone's culture. So for me, that means pinging my team and being like, I'm really sorry, I'm stuck on a call. And for mm. other people, it means accepting that I'm running a little bit late and it's very much not a reflection on how I see their time. So, yeah, mm. so that's one of the one of the things. If you were starting your career all over again in tech and sales and deal does what's one thing you do differently i would worry less about mm. how people perceive me um mm. and i think that's something that you know as a woman in tech but also as like someone who doesn't have a tech background you know i'm not an engineer i'm not in finance mm. but i definitely suffered a lot with imposter syndrome and you know, I'd sit in these rooms and I would go, oh, people are looking at me to make a decision here. And I don't know if I'm the right person to do that. And I still have that to this day. And I, I work really hard to like make sure no one sees that in me. But I think if I could go back in time and, you know, give, uh, you know, the nine, nine years ago, Megan, uh, a bit of advice, it would be nobody knows you don't know what you're doing <laughs> so just take a deep breath make the decision people trust you you've got a good head on your shoulders and I think that's the change I would make is worry less and everybody around you also doesn't know everything that they're doing right. so exactly we're, exactly we're, we're all walking around in a, in a <laughs> vat of imposter syndrome and some of us just happen to exactly. swim better than others <laughs> That's exactly it. I love that analogy. <laughs> Megan, this has been a fantastic interview. I've been speaking to Megan Smith, the Senior Manager of Deal Desk at HubSpot. Megan, thank you so much for making the time and we'll catch you again next time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.